Hello all, and thank you for coming. Welcome to Designing Prismatically Black Radical Futures with the inaugural Afrotectopia Imagineer Fellows. It's so exciting to be able to gather and have the fellows present their work and talk about the things that they were up to and ideas and their brilliancy uh, we'll all be able to learn from today. So before we begin, I wanna give some context for those that haven't maybe been involved with what we've been doing since through the Imaginariums and other ways. So I'm gonna give context as far as how all of this was created and how we've engaged in this fellowship. So every day in our, in our fellowship on Sundays, we would start off with saying welcome and good morning, actually, instead of afternoon, it's 1 p.m. today, Eastern time, but usually we would start 10 a.m. Uh, Easter time. And in that time, because we have such an international cohort, we, everyone is coming in on different uh, time zones and we wanted to respect that. So welcome and good afternoon to those that are on the East Coast, but also morning, um, to those that are in other areas and evening. So the fellowship, uh, I'll go into why it was created, what we intended to do and what the goals were. And so why was the fellowship created? For one, it was very much about individualism versus community and that's really leaning into community. Oftentimes fellowships can be a pretty siloed practice and you know, artists working on their own work, but this one was very much about how can we get all these brilliant minds together to think collectively about the same ideas and work in collaboration. So thinking about thinking, working in community and creating for community. Our fellows were coming from a variety of different expertise, and this is something that is standard of Afrotectopia. We have people that are coming from all disciplines um, because we're designing futures, and when you're doing that, you have to be comprehensive and inclusive of people of different backgrounds. So our fellows, consisted of people doing cartography, poetics, memory, cur curatorial practices, geography, machine learning, and so on. And we also were intentional about realizing that and, and emphasizing that blackness is not a monolith. So understanding that the identity, the racial political identity of blackness is not something that everyone ho holds in a similar way and people coming from different cultural, geographical, and other backgrounds, it changes the way that you embrace and uh, engage in your blackness. So people, the fellows were coming from a variety of different cultural and other uh, identities that influenced their race. Also prismatic perspectives in that it was not just about race and culture as far as, um, you know, the political race ideologies, but it's also about uh, sexuality and socioeconomic status and all of these different identifiers that allow them to be allow them to come with a fuller breadth of experience and ways that they can use that in creating their work. So I'll go into introducing the fellows a bit. Uh, we have Medebo Fatunde, who is a writer and futurist based in Cleveland, Ohio. We have uh, Isaiah Murray, who uh, does work in urban technology from San Antonio, Texas. We have Nika Sobers, who does work in urban planning and design and UX and tech from uh, currently in New York City. We have Josie Williams, who studies machine learning uh, currently in Norwalk, Connecticut. We have Ya Ade, who studies curatorial practices and African invention, who's currently in Accra, Ghana. We have Morgan P. Vickers, who studies geographies, ethnographies, research, and, and history, currently in Oakland, California. We have Lea Alapini, who studies architecture, design, and technology, currently in the Netherlands. We have Bo uh, Bonnet, who studies philosophy and social cultural analysis and game design, currently in New York City. Jonathan Odor, who studies accounting and finance and is a writer, currently based in London, United Kingdom. And we have Nikki Franco, who uh, engages a lot with community organizing and currently based in Miami, Florida. So before we started the fellowship uh, and, and collaborating, it was important for me to set context to the fellows as far as, you know, what are the ideologies of Afrodictopia? And one central one, central one being, uh, technology is merely an extension of human capability. Technology does not have to be something, that, technology is not synonymous with digitality is the way that Afrotectopia embraces technology. It's merely an extension. And if we get out of this human-centric ideologies of human capability, technology is merely an extension of sentient capability. So it's about all forms of life that are using various forms of technologies to extend their capabilities. And so in our objectives for this fellowship, it was one, to build a micro community of imaginative innovators, to collaboratively develop healthy black futures and to share all research. And so our outputs, outputs have been an Imagineer syllabus, which the Imagineers very impressively created on the first day uh, and 
in, similar to the final form that it is today, just filling in with so much knowledge and research. The second being four prototype divisions with two to four different micro versions. With us having 10 different fellows, we were able to break up and different fellows were able to focus on different parts of the particular vision for that week. 10 recap essays, which will be uh, published and sent out, and the presentation, which we're doing today. And so the products that we engage when we're designing culturally relevant pedagogy for remote learning amidst poverty, inventing Black radical technoculture, uh, Afrotectopia slash Black Futures Manifesto, designing future cities, and then we intended to do future protests, but we ended up not doing a fifth project and instead using that time to uh, revisit the past projects and hone those in a little more. So as I mentioned, we started off by creating a syllabus. And so we engage with designing the syllabus that brought in a whole bunch of different research based on our different selected projects. And when you have a group as impressive and innovative as this one, it was very easy for them to just bring in the different things that they knew and fill it into the syllabus on the first day. And so we sent out the syllabus and everyone had access to it because a big part of Aftertopia is making sure that all the research that we do is community accessible and that anyone that wants to build off of it can. And then we had Imaginariums to uh, complement the Imagineer Fellowship. And this was created because in having conversations with people that wanted to be Imagineer Fellows, the biggest thing that they wanted was just a space to uh, learn and ideate and imagine amongst other Black people. And so in hearing them, that further affirmed the need to just create a public space that was doing similar things as the Imagineer Fellows, um, but was allowed for anyone to join. And so the Imaginarium served that purpose in allowing us to expand the research, theorization, and practice uh, with the fellowship, within the fellowship to the wider Black community. And so we had it every Tuesday, free, open to the public on Zoom. And when we had the Imaginariums, we had different guest speakers that were prolific in the areas that we were talking about that week. And so we had Olivia Michaela Ross for Inventing Black Radical Technoculture, Ayoda Molo Kunsende for Afrotectopia Black Future Cities, Alelekin Jefus for Designing Future Cities, and Glenn Cantave for Future Protests. And in the Imaginariums, after the presenters uh, shared their work and we had a Q&A with them, we then broke up into intimately sized groups for conversation and community building. And this allowed for the larger group to get, uh, have, have the opportunity to engage in intimate conversations, get to know each other, further the community building, but also answer the props that we had prepared for them in relation to the ideas that we were discussing for that week. And as they did that in their own you know, breakout rooms, they were also able to see what everyone else was doing in the entire call um, because we had a shared mural board that everyone was collaboratively editing. And then we would gather for the last 30 minutes in a conversation. And so the people that joined us in the Imaginarium calls would come, uh, we would all come back together and for the last 30 minutes and talk about anything that we thought of, any ideas that came up in our intimate conversations or you know, just continue to ideate. And sometimes we would stay on a uh, topic of what that week we were discussing and sometimes we would go completely off, but every week it was always so insightful and you know, renewing uh, and very intergenerational. We had people from different, many different generations contributing their ideas and we were able to learn from each other. And so that applied to the fellowship in that the Imaginariums were open, public, anyone could access them that were black or of Pan-African descent um, and we were able, as the fellows were then able to use what was discussed in the Imaginariums to influence and ground the work that they were doing as fellows. And so in the fellowship, we started off each day by reflecting on the different readings that we had for that week and reflecting on the, the ideas and insight that came out of the Imaginariums. And then we had guest presenters, so uh, that were, you know, doing again prolific work in their fields that were relating to our week's discussion. So we had Cordine Lewis, founder of Youth Design Center, including Made in Brownsville for designing culturally relevant pedagogy for remote learning amidst poverty. We had Rafael Sergio Smith, design director at IDEO for inventing Black radical techniculture. We had Sike uh, Tefese of uh, Bufu for Afrotectopia Black Futures Manifesto and Emma Osor, co-founder of Black Space for Designing Future Cities. After we had the conversation with the presenter, we would then take a break, reflect a bit on the things that we had discussed and learned from the presenter, and then we would go and also eat and nourish ourselves, and then we would go into vision mapping for 
the second part of the day, where we would return to the, the main central idea, the project that we were working on, and then just write down different things that came up in our conversations, break it up, find some central key points that we could then build a project off of. And so the fellows would then break up into their groups. They would self-identify with which project they wanted, which aspect of the project they wanted to work on, and then they would go into prototyping, rapid prototyping. So for about an hour, the fellows would then break up into groups, and we usually use the business model canvas as a good way to dive into each pillared facet of the project so we can be as depth as in-depth as possible, though our time was limited. So that was the prototyping part. And then once they prototyped, I would then translate all their work and findings and research and notes into visually, uh, visually compelling sources of information and share it online so that everyone could then use it and learn from what the fellows were thinking and ideating. And so the goals of this Imaginarium have been to build a vibrant international and multi-dimensional black micro community of innovators to contribute to and create healthy visions of Black futures from a prismatic collection of perspectives, and to develop open source interdisciplinary pedagogy so that all can learn and build off of the work that has been done, and to plant seeds for radical Black imagination being one of the most important part in that often the work that we do at Afrojectopia is not about us reaping the benefit of it immediately, but it's about investing in the community in a sustainable and long-term and long vision uh, foresight sort of form. So now we're going to move into presentations, uh, which I'm so excited for. These fellows have been really incredible and in engaging in so much research and collective conversation and ideating and imagining. And now they're going to share their work uh, and all their findings in quick presentations, and then we'll follow up with the group discussion. So next up, we have Nikki. years around defunding school policing and doing um, bailout work and sort of educating folks through collective study and praxis on how the carceral state sort of impacts all these facets of our lives. Um, so I wanted to start off with an Adrienne Marie Brown quote from Emergent Strategy, where she offers that all organizing is science fiction, that we are shaping the future we long for and not yet experienced. I believe that we're in an imagination battle and almost everything how we orient toward our bodies is shaped by fearful imaginations. Um, and I think that the fact that this fellowship is the Imagineer Fellowship like was really, really timely. I think I've said it multiple times um, with other folks, like it felt like divine timing. Um, recognizing that we had the political backdrop of COVID, compounding crisis, mass unemployment, um, remote everything, social distancing, and a global uprising in response to state violence and white supremacy. Um, so I think for me, being someone who identifies as an abolitionist, as someone who's constantly looking of ways to plant seeds of this imagination, um, being in this space with folks um, was really beautiful for me. I think to be totally transparent, I have a lot of critiques of tech as an industry and sort of the things that tech uh, facilitates, particularly like the military and prison industrial complex, surveillance, um, algorithmic policing, and oh, many, many other things. Um, but I think being in this space and being able to meet all the other fellows and learning about the interventions that each person has been taking in their own respective projects, tech or otherwise, I think was really humbling for me. I think sometimes, um, I'm a Gemini, so I think sometimes we like to think that we know a lot and we know everything. And I think through this process and the weekly discussions, I was really humbled and learned a lot of the ways in which it's not just organizers looking for interventions to social issues, but really it is so many radical Black folks across um, practice, practices and spaces like this where we get to sort of exchange and be vulnerable and be honest are so, so, so valuable. Um, we can move to the next slide. And yeah, this this is what this is kind of how I think of abolition. I think that abolition necessitates imagination. I think that abolition is not simply about absence, and but it's also about the presence of what people deserve, long for, and dream of. So for me, having this space every week this summer, you know, throughout the summer with these folks and having the really hard conversations of 
um, recognizing how interwoven and entrenched these systems are, but also recognizing how powerful we are um, when we're in community. And especially, I think the, the fact that it was an international space was also incredible. Um, I, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I also wrote this. I wrote that, you know, understanding that I live in the empire and cultural hegemony of the West. And I also like to think of Miami as an important node of empire and maintaining um, such hegemony. I think being able to share space with folks like Ya in Accra or Jonathan in London um, and, and then all over, really all over, um, for me kind of helped me sharpen up and tune, fine tune kind of my own perspective of how I'm approaching my day to day, how I'm approaching my cultural work, my political work, and even how I'm moving and orienting myself towards my relationships. Um, and it also deepened my sense of global solidarity with all Black folks fighting capitalism, white supremacy, and imperialism. And I think we all can recognize that in a moment of all the compounding crises we have experienced this year alone, um, the sort of veil of American exceptionalism has been lifted, not just for folks who call themselves quote unquote radical, but really just for everyday people. And I believe that the urgency for internationalism is as crucial as ever. And I think that through this fellowship that didn't just feel like tongue in cheek or, you know, like this aspiration, but it really felt like something I was in, in real practice of. Um, yeah, I will go on to the next slide. Yeah, for the new world to root and materialize, we cannot rely on the systems and imaginations that got us here in the first place. Designing radical Black futures is not a utopia, but rather our, necess our necessary hope. And again, this is like one of those thoughts that I think are constantly lingering in my mind as uh, someone who likes to think of themselves as visionaries and trying to you know, think of problem solve, ways to problem solve very particular issues that are very complex and nuanced. Um, but I wanna say that the weekly conversations with everyone between co-creating the syllabus so quickly, like the, the sort of brilliance and knowledge and insight that is present in this cohort is just, it just like makes me emotional because it's so amazing. Um, so the ability for us to just like co-create a syllabus and share resources and like debate and discuss and also having the guest speakers every week and also being able to kind of think of them as resources, asking difficult questions and also ideation. I think for me, that is also so important for my work, not just ideation, but also execution, right? I think um, it's some, at, at least as an organizer, um, sometimes we are very good at articulating the issues and the problems and maybe not quite as good as articulating potential solutions and potential interventions and how we get there, how we actually bring those to life and to fruition. And something about actually having to be in a small group and coming, coming up with something kind of for me shook me out of my own like internalized shame or internalized sense of lack of expertise, like these really like bourgeois things and kind of like just moved me into my protagonism to just try things out, even if I didn't have all the answers, quote unquote, but to actually think of like, what would, a, what would be a tool that would be helpful in mapping out resources if we defund the police, for example? What would be a useful, t um, useful toolkit for educators as they're moving into remote learning, knowing that students are facing mass poverty because of mass unemployment, mass displacement in this time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time. I think I'm on my time, but I feel like I can talk about the, Imagine the Imagineer Fellowship for many, many minutes and many hours. And I really just wanna extend my gratitude to everyone who built this space alongside with me. And thank you to Adi and thank you to everyone who's here with us and just curious to learn more about what we were up to. It was truly a beautiful space. And I know that this is gonna be a community we're gonna constantly be tapping into. So thank you. That was beautiful.
Wonderful. Now we're going to go to Isaiah. So let me share a different screen. All righty, we ready to go? Yep, all you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, thank you for coming to our presentation today. Uh, my name is Isaiah. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And I'll be sharing some of my reflections on the Afrotopia experience. Um, I found it appropriate to title this talk, Reinvigorating the Village Mind. Um, when I was accepted to the Afrotopia Fellowship, um, the other fellows became my village albeit on Zoom, um, but the space, uh, this is a space I was looking for and I'm very happy to have been a part of it and continue to be a part of it. Um, my talk is gonna be broken into two parts. So first I'm gonna give a little personal anecdote and I call that homecoming and that's the top part of the slide. And the second half will be an explanation of one of our creations and I call that homemade. So um, before I go on to the first section, I'd like to open up with this. And I read, um, the rhetoric of individualism has turned us away from the communal mindset. Our generosity has vanished amidst the need to receive after giving. Our interactions have morphed into transactions and the exchange of good vibes and wholesome energy has become unfamiliar. Love is a language we all speak, yet it has become mute. Our communities are suffering in silence, struggling to achieve alone what togetherness would have already accomplished. Neighborhoods are bleak, seeming to be a row of roofs, housing insular people. Villages, on the other hand, raise the consciousness of the collective and the magical powers contained within. So that's um, something that I wrote and that's how I feel about the Afrotopia experience these past six weeks that I've spent with these amazing people. And now I'll continue on to the first section um, titled Homecoming. So this is a personal, an personal anecdote and um, this is how I felt before the Afrotopia experience. So I had just graduated from undergrad and I had plans to move to New York City to pursue a master's degree in urban technology. Um, the coronavirus pandemic had canceled those plans and I found myself back at home with my family in San Antonio um, to attend Zoom University. And um, although I'd be saving money, um, not spending it on New York City rent, um, I still needed a place for myself, uh, especially if I was gonna be studying. So we turned the shed in my backyard into a tiny home and you can't see now because I have my, um, my uh, background on, but I'm living in the tiny home now, so I'm very happy about that. And uh, fortunately, um, in my, in my uh, situation, I was able to gather all of the resources I needed to live comfortably uh, during the pandemic, but this didn't um, remove the thought of the others that were in my community um, that are not so fortunate um, during this transition to remote uh, learning. So just a little bit of context, uh, San Antonio is ranked one of the most uh, soci uh, socioeconomically uh, segregated cities in the United States. And I've heard stories of students who park their cars outside of libraries after they've already closed just to have access to Wi-Fi to do their homework. And not to mention um, there are parents who relied on the school system to provide meals and care for their children while they were away at work. Um, so these are the realities that existed outside of my, my tiny home. And um, having been away for five years um, in undergrad, um, coming back to San Antonio was a bit difficult for me. And I often tried to articulate my community's reality through the theoretical perspectives I had um, learned in school. Um, but this was an unending conversation that happened in my head. And I often felt unsettled and anxious um, living in and outside of my experience. So being a participant yet an observer in my reality, I had a hard time um, merging those two perspectives to agree. And in the end, I realized that they didn't need to and that they shouldn't. Um, I realized there was no such thing as a formal education, but instead there are many ways of knowing. So, during this time, I know this was what happened for myself. Um, and the reason I call this homecoming is because um, now that many of us are returning back to our homes during this, uh, this pandemic, I wonder if others are returning to their foundational roots of knowing. Um, having this as a premise, I'd like to move into the second half of the presentation, which is called Homemade. So this uh, section, wants, um, I wanted to highlight the importance of the village mind and the type of things that we can create um, from our home and being in a space that we called home. 
So uh, each week of the fellowship, we had a different theme. And for our first week, we discussed what it, uh, what it meant to design a culturally relevant pedagogy for remote learning amidst poverty. Um, and we, were, we read, read uh, Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. And from that reading, there were two things that stood out to me. Uh, the first being that learning occurs at the intersection of body, mind, and spirit. And secondly, um, the need to horizontalize the classroom. And in other words, that means to create a space where teachers can be learners and learners can be teachers. And that can happen by drawing on personal experience. So uh, one of our creations from the breakout group um, that we had for that week, um, we developed a concept for an app that suggests a crowdsourced personalized curriculum based on someone's interest and emotional state. So to kind of elaborate, uh, community members would contribute to the database of learning material by sharing uh, books, articles, uh, music, life experiences, um, adventures or activities, and then they would tag that experience with um, an emotion that they associate with it. And then users from that community can then type in what they want to learn and how they feel at that moment and the app will suggest a learning material. So because traditional education often encourages a uh, mind-body split, um, using the term from uh, uh, Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress, um, we aim to connect the two by making the learning material community driven. So not only will this be beneficial to our current situation, being that we're remote, um, but this, this, these compiled experiences from communities um, is a way to archive our experience and preserve them for future generations. And um, the, the conversations that sprouted from this creative process, I had a really great time. Um, and they made me realize um, that we need to archive our own knowledge um, by doing deep introspection and then to assign value to it by practicing it. And um, as a community, uh, I believe that we work best together. And in the words of Octavia Butler, uh, there's no moon, but we can see very well that the sky is full of stars. stars. Uh, thank you, and that concludes uh, my little talk. Thank you. All right, after Isaiah, we have Nika. Nika, it's all you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nika, and my pronouns are she, her. So I'm New York City based and um, I'm really grateful to share the space with you all. Um, it was definitely really great to take time to reflect on what this summer has been like um, with the rest of these fellows. And I, I'm just feeling really grateful for how I've grown, how I've seen everyone grow and how I continue to inspire or continue to, or how I know I'll continue to be inspired by everyone in this room as I move forward and my journey. Um, so a little bit about myself. I am a designer, uh, an urban designer specifically, who really loves to dream a lot. Um, I definitely spend a lot of my time whenever the news is like too overwhelming. I just zone out and I try to think of a better possible future for myself. But oftentimes I feel like I've discounted my daydreams as just like silly distractions um, that are taking me away from the present. But one thing that really stuck with me throughout this fellowship was really challenging my idea of what the value of my dreams are. So through um, the Afrotectopia syllabus that we talked about before, there are tons of really amazing artists and bodies of work um, that really helped me understand the power of speculative design. So from Octavia Butler to um, some designers like Ola Ken and Raphael Smith, um, I really feel like the power, of this, the power of speculative design has the power to really heal us through our societal trauma. So I wanna read a quote that I wrote in my reflection, um, but speculative art derives from various stories of the future from present struggles while telling alternative stories about how the world came to be. This form of radical imagination provokes a wider conversation and critical reflection on the future we are constructing. It is a mechanism that forces us to examine, process, and build past our societal trauma. So next slide. So thinking a little bit more about societal trauma and how we can actually 
be healed through speculative art, I wanted to narrow in on this one specific um, example that came out of one of the uh, fellowship talks that we had. So we had a guest speaker, Raphael Smith. I know Ari um, showed a little screenshot of this, but just to summarize, Raphael, um, who works, who's the director at IDEO, he um, takes some time every Saturday to just create sketches based on research that he did on emerging technologies, but also just like societal problems. So one of his sketches that he created is called Solar Power Reparations. So it was a strategy where we take solar power satellites, send them off the space to get all that um, solar energy and bring it down to earth and sell that uh, solar energy. And all the money from solar energy um, is, goes as reparations to black and brown communities that have constantly been marginalized and exploited. Um, and obviously like our racial wealth gap in the United States is growing. So this example, you know, it seems fun and exciting, but it really, it really sat with me. Um, it made me really wonder like, well, why can't this be? I mean, Raphael did the research and he really connected the dots between all of these systems that you didn't even think would go together. And it was really just like the process of really thinking about how can I make this future happen? Like, how do I live in a world um, that came out of Raphael's head? That is, the, that is the power of speculative art that I wanted to talk about. Like that, that conversation that I have with the artists, but also myself to kind of realize this potential future, a future that's just and beautiful and polychromatic, that is, that really helped me acknowledge the pain of living in the present, but giving me hope to move forward and giving me the tools and the vocabulary, the language to try to create and, move, and, create and build this, this future that I wanna see. Um, so I, uh, another quote that I had in my, um, in my reflection I wanted to share is that um, although this pain that I, or although this is a pain that I feel and witness daily, this forced acknowledge it makes the invisible system of oppression tangible and provides me with potential actionable ways of overcoming the aspect of our lived experience. I believe radical imagination from marginalized communities is an essential form of healing from societal trauma by protecting space for imagine, uh, emancipatory aspiration and critical optimism. Next slide. So another artist, I mean, there were many, <laughs> but I just tried to pick just a few that I really thought um, that really resonated with me. But one um, Imaginarium guest, you may have been in his presentation, um, Olakan, uh, Olalakan. So he is an architect who creates these beautiful renderings of just like visions of the future, whether it's in Lagos, whether it's in Brooklyn. Olalakan's um, objective is to try to create a conversation using architectural renderings around helping us um, value the things that aren't really valued in our present world. So I think that as a designer myself, I was technically very interested in his work. Like his images are so beautiful and they really, they're so powerful. Like I can just think of a million ways I would want to live in the city. Um, but one thing that I thought was really interesting is his honesty and reflecting on as an artist, how are we also creating art that inspires and creates a conversation across the diaspora without also being prescriptive and fetishizing a black aesthetic. Um, so I thought that that was a really interesting point to think about. Like as we create our own art and our own dreams, how are we also making sure that they're inclusive visions, inclusive aesthetics um, that help build solidarity across uh, the diaspora without being too prescriptive? Um, but I, I also just appreciated the honesty and the reflection in his work and his work is really amazing. So I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Next slide. So during Afrotectopia, I feel like I, again, saw myself as a daydreamer, but never really took my dreams quite seriously. And it was just so inspiring to have conversations with the fellows with the present the presenters with myself honestly to really think of the value of how my dreams are just the start of a greater conversation with myself in the world that really can happen 
it can happen if we work collaboratively, if we are honest with each other, and if we help continue to inspire each other. Uh, so this quote really uh, stood out to me, and it's really around the role of the artist making the revolution irresistible. So no matter what your dreams are, no matter what your medium is, the point is to put it out there and to help other people dream. So I just want to close with one more quote from my reflection. Um, so before Afrotectopia, I considered myself a daydreamer. I can only dream of what a just future could look like. By having my world be expanded by the amazing syllabus readings and the conversations with my fellow Imagineers, I will no longer discount my daydreams as pointless distractions. These dreams are seeds of my radical imagination, planting vibrant and speculative visions, which provide me with tools that can help me heal and actualize a hopeful world that is for me, for us. My dreams are only the threads of a speculative tapestry that it that is in a continual state of curiosity, evolution, emergence, and revolution. So thank you so much, everyone, for all the energy and love that I've received during the summer. And I'm just really excited to continue to keep growing. And I encourage you all to keep inspiring each other and keep growing yourselves. Thank you. Amazing. I wish you all could hear applause. It's so, each of you deserve it. Um, but I'm also realizing I'm not introducing you all uh, before you present. So I'm just going to run through the um, who has presented so far, their introductions, and then we'll go back to um, the order. So with Nikki, Nikki's bio, um, just so you all can get to know who's presenting and where they're coming from. Nikki is an abolitionist, community organizer, writer, facilitator of spaces for collective study, seeking to disrupt the institutionalized bureaucratic frameworks of academia and transactional ways in which relationships exist under capitalism. Her work experiments with truth telling, radical history and thought and revolutionary imagination. She also curates educational and cultural programming that navigates the current urgency on global solidarity environmental and ancestral preservation and strategies on building emotional and intellectual capacities to dismantle systems of oppression that inform and deform our current lives. She is the host of Getting to the Root of It with Venus Roots, a podcast that leans into conversation with artists, theorists, and organizers. Second was Isaiah, and I'll read Isaiah's bio. Isaiah Murray, is an incoming graduate student at Cornell Tech where he will be preserving a master's, pursuing a master's degree in urban tech, urban technology. He studied urban planning and data science in undergrad and his research interests lie in revolutionizing participatory planning, understanding community behavior, behavioral uh, dynamics and technologies for collective storytelling. He's delved into these topics while working with various research groups, including the Urban Future Lab, the Border Tech Lab, the Social Dynamics Lab. Across his work, he tries to incorporate his values of cosmopolitanism, egalitarianism, authenticity, and love. When away from academics, he likes to spend time dancing, hanging out with family and friends, and improving his channels for creative expression, such as making electronic music, playing the piano, singing, Feel free to reach out to him. He is always open to new experiences and connecting with others. Third, and who just presented was Nika, and I'll read Nika's bio. Nika is an urban designer working to dismantle structural oppression and catalyze equitable anti-racist futures, working at the intersection of urban planning, empathetic design, UX research, and civic technology. Nika designs transformations that restructure the relationship between marginalized communities and the built environment. Her work includes helping communities of color develop ownership and management of self-supporting communal systems, such as community-driven urban, community-run urban infrastructure, local communal, local circular economies, uh, and local circle economies. Currently, Nika is a product manager at NYC Planning Labs. Prior to her time at NYC Planning Labs, Nika co-founded a civic tech startup that helped low-income communities manage self-organized infrastructure systems, such as waste management, powered by barter-based digital economy. Nika also worked as a design research lead at WeWork. Nika holds a Master of City Planning from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, with a concentration in city design, and a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Planning with a minor in Landscape Architecture from Virginia Tech. 
And so now coming up next is uh, Jonathan, and I'll read Jonathan's bio. Jonathan Odor is an undergraduate student starting his third year at the University of Kent in September, studying accounting and finance. He is currently undergoing an internship at Google EMEA. Jonathan is a freelance writer who aims to mobilize his audience to bring about societal change. His work is mostly centered around youth crime and areas of deprivation, using his experiences growing up in the London borough of Newham to pre present solutions and reveal undiscussed causes in his writings. Jonathan has previously written for The Crawl, contributing a memoir on Pan-Africanist Thomas Sankara. He has also written for publisher Left Foot Forward, where he discusses the consequences of over-policing in deprived areas, as well as the impact it will have specifically on minority ethnic groups. So Jonathan, I'm gonna pull up your slides. Thank you, Ari. You are welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for this virtual background. It's not really um, working with you. It's not really working with me right now, but it's fine. Um, thank you for the introduction, Ari. So I thought today to bring forward um, my experiences working with this cohort before I start anything. So as you can tell, well, perhaps if you're aware of my, my family name, Obote, um, it's from my family name, Obote, you may recognize it from the Pan-African. Milton Obote, former president of Uganda, who's my great uncle. So before I start, I would just like to say that um, the entire experience of working within an international cohort of absolutely fascinating and raging individuals was a joy of my summer. The recognized necessity for international projects that celebrate and ablaze black unification is ramified within this fellowship and designing and uh, designing healthy and imaginative futures has undoubtedly broadened my perspectives and nourished my desires to um, help bring about a more egalitarian worldview. Our gainful collaborations and assiduous um, discussions have forever enriched me intellectually. Um, and with that, I, c I hope I can go and do the same to others just like now. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So how speculative fiction impacts our lives. Um, so the reality of speculative fiction is that it addresses our contemporary political state categorically. So writers for centuries have influenced uh, their socio-political climates using their awe-inspiring abilities to configure alternative realities. Even if their relative domains aren't uh, specific to speculative fiction, uh, writers such as Shakespeare, Aristotle, Karl Marx, Plato, Jose Marti, etc. Which leads me on to this image that you see on your left. Um, those of you who don't know who this is are probably looking at this really confused right now, not knowing why this guy is here, what he's holding, etc. Um, the image itself is a picture of Captain Kirk from Star Trek, holding what seems to be a mobile phone. Um, mobile phones that are probably on your side or perhaps something that you're using right now. This image itself was broadcasted seven years before um, the mobile phone was created. So you can accredit Star Trek, I guess, for uh, your mobile phones. Uh, next slide, please. As, um, as Nikki alluded to earlier, she highlighted a bit of pessimism towards um, technology as it can also be as damaging as it is progressive. So speculative fiction has introduced and will continue to introduce society to real world science and technology, at which point someone who has watched or read of the aforementioned innovations will go on to create it. 
we all stand to benefit from these innovations, hopefully. I'm relatively pessimistic that tech companies and the government's regulating them truly have the interests of the people at heart and will sway from the ethical pitfalls depicted in this dystopic literature. I do hope I'm wrong, but from this extract, a topic discussed in our third week, Greenfield, the author of Radical Technologies, encapsulates this in saying that these, de these devices do significantly condition our approach to the world in all sorts of subtle but pervasive ways. Um, whilst also acknowledging that they don't outright determine our actions. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and I would be remiss if I failed to mention the impact of Chadwick Boseman in his inspirator role as King T'Challa in Black Panther and what this had on black culture internationally. Um, to my opinion, it's the most culturally provocative black movie that's ever been made. Um, the movie itself confronted a flurry of topical issues, as you can see, including technology, feminism, colonialism, Afrofuturism, globalism versus isolationism, and most notably, black identity. And for me, the portrayal of black people in a regal, adroit, and imposing matter of reality was refreshing. Um, the extract you see before you captures the fact that speculative fiction, black futures, and Afrofuturism all to be seen collaboratively is necessary in trying to make our societies, our world, a better place to live. Uh, last slide, please. So yeah, finally, factually, the future doesn't even exist yet. So speculative fiction is fashioned to aid the prevention and the invention of what stands to be our future. Itself, itself as a genre has the power to liberate one's imagination, imagination. And with that, I leave you with this quote from Albert Einstein for you to keep in mind. Imagination is more important than knowledge. So yeah, I believe my time is up. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, and next we're going to go with Leia. I'm gonna pull up your slides. All right, Leia is, I'm um, just gonna introduce Leia first. Leia Lapini is a 23 year old master science student at the Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment in TU Delft, uh, Netherlands. Leia is working at the intersection of architecture, design and technology. She co-founded in 2018 Base Material Works Collective, bringing into focus international contributors around emerging architectural and territorial issues with the focus on digital fabrication. As a researcher, she explores the relationship, the relation between bodies and large scale digital infrastructure. As a designer, she's interested in the in potential and materiality such as bio-based components of digital materiality. Leia also studied at the Royal Danish Academy of the Arts, exploring territorial implications of evolving geographical conditions. She applied her expertise through various professional experiences in Denmark, France, and the Netherlands. Leia, it's all you. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, uh, good morning, good evening. Um, I, ho I hope you can hear me well. Um, um, yeah, so um, I will try to introduce myself briefly and also talk about a few of the prototypes and ideas that we developed during the during the Fruitectopia Imagine Fellowship. I'm really sorry I have lots of slides because I was afraid that because my English is not so good that maybe I should put lots of images so you guys get to see really where I want to go. And uh, uh, yeah, so sorry, Ari, but I, I'm going to say a lot. Uh, I'm going to tell you a lot to move on, on, on the next slide. So could you please go to the next slide? Um, um, can you? 
can you hear me? Oh yeah, okay. So yeah, I decided to um, uh, call the essay that I wrote for um, the end of this fellowship, uh, three part notes on the Afrofuturist world building strategies. So we can move to the next slide. Oh uh, yeah, so as Ari already said, I'm interested in architecture, design technology, and this is why I tried to, in this presentation, kind of um, um, really come back on the, on, the, on the ideas that we developed during these fellowships and that we're kind of close to these uh, disciplines and how I got to improve these, uh, some of the ideas uh, through this uh, experience. We can move to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so as a final contribution to the 2020 Architectural Pierre Imaginé Fellowship, I decided to write a test that looks back at two ideas, two quick prototypes that we developed during the fellowship. And yeah, on the, on the, on the, third, uh, in the third time, I, I will reflect a bit more on this experience and what it brought me on a more personal level, let's say. So we can move to this next slide. Yeah, so first, uh, first part of the essay, and first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, called um, School is Out, so for uh, affordable remote learning tools to new learning spaces in the new digital era. So we can move to the next slide. I thought that was interesting to sort of start with this idea, this prototype, because as you know, well, in the past few months, of course, everybody had to experience kind of forced, in a forced way, remote learning, and it became kind of a standard in most education programs. And so it did uh, with the tools that give access to it. So computer, phone, sufficient internet connection. So if we move to the next slide, we, we can, um, and yeah, we can also move to the next slide. I, I kind of like to, um, I, I kind of re reflected a lot on what is actually this current standard, what are those tools and what types of tool and in this context, can we try to actually reimagine self-sustaining economic models for education, educational institutions that could in a way promote maybe sufficient culturally relevant and accessible tools for the students and communities. And I like this quote that is that I taken from a, a performance of an American artist that says that the whiteness embedded in technological device uh, are uh, there are standard for innovation. Uh, and yeah, because uh, they're embedded directly in the interface. So uh, in this context, uh, we try to imagine self-sustaining economic models and I made quite some uh, drawings, quite some sketches. So, oh. I think, can you still guys hear me? I think my internet connection is for a little bit. We can hear you now. Maybe, okay. Okay, if, if it still doesn't work, I'll just share my data. Okay. So if you move to the next slide, and um, yeah. I've made a few uh, sketches just to explain some of the ideas that we've been talking about. But yeah, for, for these prototypes especially, the idea was to kind of think of school as in a new way because, of it, complete, because it was completely changed in the past few months. And we kind of tried to reflect on it as a way to sort of um, um, transform the idea of school itself and to kind of um, allow for it to be much more flexible and much more kind of um, uh, anchored, let's say, in an urban environment. So one of, some of the ideas that we came up with were like quick programming, right? For instance, any spaces, transform them maybe um, to uh, then generate some sort of uh, income that would directly be reinvesting the educational community, or perhaps also maybe invest in new spaces as a new ground for alternative learning and culturally adapted teaching, or support and, and promote alternative digital learning tools. So to kind of move away from the giants of the sectors and maybe um, in favor of locally based softwares and uh, yeah, maybe look more locally stored data. Uh, so um, yeah, especially in a very uh, uh, difficult, let's say uh, conditions and background. Oh uh, yeah, you can move to the next slide. I made a few sketches to kind of uh, share this idea um, of uh, yeah, one of those prototypes that we came up with. Uh, which was uh, the idea of a mutual aid model map. So uh, a digital knowledge map that would be directly kind of referring to the idea of uh, the architect and anthropologist Senam Kofi, who is based in, based in Ghana and who is working a lot on alternative vision of the African smart city. So yeah, we can move to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, so here you have a, a sketch of what could be this urban map, for instance, and how you could perhaps 
imagine kind of like a floating Wi-Fi balloon in the city to kind of allow connection to be more equally kind of distributed, let's say. Um, we can also move to the next slide. Yes, yeah, so lots of drawing, lots of sketches on how also we could imagine small structures to kind of be implemented in an urban environment and how we can make this as a kind of like uh, sustain sustainable models using material and digital fabrication. Uh, yeah, and if we move to the second section, uh, that was the idea in the, in the second time to use uh, radical technologies sorry like it's really noisy in the background but to use radical technologies uh, as a way to understand world making mechanisms so i think this part is based on the work of adam greenfield like uh, jonathan said before and his book on radical technologies so we can move to the next slide so these technologies in a way are not so radical because they're mostly te technologies of the everyday and the everyday life so i think it's really important for us to kind of work with these technologies as a way to also convey new ideas. So in the Imaginarium, there are two prototypes and two ideas that were based on using augmented reality uh, as a way to kind of arouse uh, the attention of the community first, and then to really use it as a critical tool to question and finally stimulate desire of the community for actions on eminence and uh, possible futures. So we can move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so um, here you have also a quote from the book of Adam Greenfield, uh, who's asking at what point does the economic calculus shift and the logic of local fabrication starts to make sense. And I feel like in those times and because of all, all the changes that we're experiencing that could be that uh, could be now, actually. So if we were all uh, willing to kind of make things change, we could use uh, um, in a very radical way those technologies. So we can move uh, to the next slide. Um, so yeah, I made a few sketches again to kind of uh, explain one of the ideas that we came up with, uh, one of the prototype that was uh, based on the idea of exploring the use of augmented reality to uh, sort of, um, 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 yeah, and sort of elaborate uh, possible speculative scenarios through like augmented reality filters, for instance that would then allow the user to kind of um, um, give the user the possibility to actually act uh, on this reality by relinking some of the, um, of the um, by a, uh, sort of like, a, uh, how do you say, it? Um, <laughs> just um, giving them the, the opportunity to act uh, within that reality actually by showing them uh, the places where they could get the resources. And for instance, we've been thinking about growing kids. So that was really the idea of uh, going from speculative design to actually building future cities, uh, which is, I think, a really interesting process. And maybe the third section that is a bit more personal, let's say. Um, so if we move again to the next one, uh, this is the last part of my essay that I, uh, yeah, that is um, called You're Not Alone, Gather, Debate, Share Ideas, Train to Solve Radical Black Futures, uh, Act as a Great Pirate. Uh, so um, if we move to the next slide, I think this last section is really, um, so this is me, yeah, this is very much about um, my personal experience, let's say, because I'm, I'm half French, I'm half Beninese, and I've always kind of been evolving in a really small town, so kind of like on my own and like with my crazy ideas, and yeah, I'm not alone, but I see that Nega is, uh, is uh, commenting something in a chat, so if we move to the next slide, I think being part of the imaginary cohort made me really realize that I didn't have to like make it all by myself and I think it's I mean it was a great relief for me and I feel like you guys should also realize that if you feel that you're kind of out of place or not alone I'm pretty sure you can find some people uh, to surround yourself with and um, yeah and I think that's the best thing that could happen to you basically and uh, yeah I think I'll just end with a quote from uh, Audre Lorde so if we move to the next slide uh, yeah, but uh, I don't know if I'm <laughs> if I'm gonna read it all because like uh, I think I've, I feel like I've been like talking too much already. But um, yeah, I think that's I mean you can read it, and I feel like uh, I've said everything I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Amazing. <laughs> all right, I wish you could hear the sounds. Okay. Uh, all right. So now. Next is Bo, 
Um, and I'm going to read Bo's bio while I pull up his slides. Bo is a multimedia artist and digital content creator based in New York City. His academic experience, their academic, academic experience is um, background in philosophy and social cultural analysis informs their work across all platforms, often folding in archival research and historical data. Bo imagines their work as semi-tangible additions to our collective conscious, stretching written Stretching written work to sonic to purely visual, each of their projects has been an attempt to expose and explain systems of power, knowledge, invisible to the eyes uh, and ears. They have a BA in social cultural analysis and philosophy from New York University and an MFA from, in computer arts from the School of Visual Arts. Currently, they're working on, from home as a freelance designer and web developer. It's all you, Bo. Hi, um, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for setting this up. Obviously, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Bo, like Ari said, um, Bo Bonnet. I use all pronouns and I'm a trans animator, black, queer developer, um, all around troublemaker, hopefully, um, based in New York City. <clears throat> So um, yeah, I, I think that's a good place to take it from too is uh, my background in philosophy because I think it does really inform so much of the work and um, I, I came to a really, like what, I, what my favorite takeaway I think from the Imagineer Fellowship from all of these talks every week and the project development piece especially was that um, what we're thinking is so embedded in everything that we're making, everything that we're doing, and how we're going about the work that we have to do, um, and the work that we want to do, you know, if you have the time. Um, so um, I will say that um, a lot of my work, and you can go to the next slide, um, a lot of my work, because I, I really am interested in interaction specifically. I do work a lot in games. A lot of the projects that I find myself drawn to are game-like. Um, and this game in particular, this is um, a VR game that I developed. Um, and this, I'll just, I'm, I'm only gonna talk a little bit about myself, I promise. You can read more if you want to <laughs> in, the, um, in, the, in the written piece. But um, yeah, essentially like I made a game trying to tackle, um, mental illness and like the institutions around it. And um, what I wanted to say about this work was that it is really reflective of a lot of my commitments at the time, which were to like interrupting, I think to borrow what Nikki said earlier, interrupting the present moment or like taking these shards of the past or taking these reflections on the present and kind of piecing together um, a mirror to show where we are, to show where we can't continue to be um, but this is not, um, and what I talk about in my essay um, is, this is not really what the future is made out of. Like these aren't the pieces that we want to build our future with, these are the pieces we want to leave behind. Um, and I think 2020 itself has done a perfectly good job of interrupting our presence um, all around. I mean, I, I hope I'm, I'm safe in assuming that. Um, and that's, uh, it's, it's, it's no longer something that I find myself focusing on. And I think a lot of that is because of the conversations we've been able to have um, in these past six weeks. Um, you can click the next slide. Um, so these are just a few of the texts that I wanted to highlight that, um, that we read over the weeks and um, kept coming back to or like finding um, new meanings in and they were so um, transformative for me personally. Um, a, lot, a lot of these slides are literally just um, like uh, highlights for me um, from the Imaginarium and specifically from the syllabus. Um, we craft the, um, we craft the future that we want to see um, with the pieces that we want to take with us. And that's 
a lot and so much of what these um what these three specific texts talk about is um learning how to take the good stuff with us and how to cut the bad stuff out um parable of the sober sower i had never read before and it was such a treat um to get to dip into um here and let that take shape in the actual work that we were doing um so much of my work before just I'll, I, I'll i'll stop harping but um so much of my work before was so dystopian in nature it was like very past and very present focused and it's um it's a uh, it's been a it's been a process of becoming a utopianist i guess um over these past six weeks learning to find the future as um a generative space and like a really really positive space. Um, you can click the next slide. Um, so what we're taking with us to, I think um, Nika talked about it in her presentation, but um, we spoke about one week in our manifest, like in trying to design a manifesto for the future. A lot of our conversation was about self-care. Um, it was about like learning how to take care of ourselves so that we make it to that future that we're building that we're actually literally in the process of planning and building and talking about together now um uh some examples here of the things that we are some of the other maybe just more quotes from things that we've read and um a short documentary that you should definitely check check out because um when we when we uh like that like all that I'm reminding myself of things in real time. <laughs> um, right. Um, so what we bring into the future is like this in incredible wealth of knowledge and this incredible wealth of past um, projections into the future um, that sustain themselves really. And um, in this short documentary, Black to Techno, the history of techno and the history um, behind these like just sound forms that are so evocative of um, our histories and our our feelings um, are so like intricately tied together, um, and that's something that I found to be especially true in our conversations. Um, I wanted to say another thing about how um, essential it is that we do this together. Um, a lot of my um, thinking in the past has been, um, a lot of my think, sorry, a lot of my thinking in the past has been, um, like when I do project into the future, it's always things like, how am I gonna eat? What am I got, like, what, am I, what work will I be doing? How much am I going to make? Or like, where will I live? Things like that, which are not very, these aren't things that are like not, at all about the future, but I think they're much more indicative of my anxieties of the present. Um, they tell much more about who I am right now and they don't actually paint a picture at all of the future that I'm trying to project myself into. Um, and all of our conversations every week we're building out together, you know, sharing our imaginations together building out these actual networks, these actual buildings, these actual spaces um, in the future and actually painting a picture of what that future could be and what it, you know, should be um, given all that we can pour in. Um, so I, um, I'll leave it there. The next slide is just a, a, small, a small joke because I, <laughs> I wanted to um, talk about how we're all future people now. Um, like I wasn't a future person in the past, being very dystopian, very Afro-pessimistic, um, but we're all future people now. Um, so don't, uh, don't look twice if you see me walking around like this. Yay, great job Bo. All right, um, next we have Morgan. I'm gonna read Morgan's. I'm going to read Morgan's bio. And Morgan's bio is uh, 
Morgan P. Vickers is a storyteller, public historian, geographer, ethnographer, researcher, and preservationist who fundamentally believes in the necessity of equitable, just, and illuminating truths. They are a second year PhD student in the Department of Geography at the University of California, Berkeley. Morgan's current work focuses on drowned towns of the Santee, Santee Cooper Project in Central South Carolina, where 901 families were dispossessed and nearly 200,000 acres of ancestral lands were drowned in the name of the New Deal progress, quote unquote progress. Morgan received their bachelor's in American studies and media studies in 2018 from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has worked with the Community, History, Community Histories Workshop, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Road Trippers Magazine, and most recently the Public Histories Pub Public Futures Initiative. Morgan is still figuring it all out. I'll leave it to you, Morgan. Hi, uh, as Adi said, I'm Morgan. Uh, I'm a geography PhD. I specifically focus on uh, Black geography. So a lot of my work is about situating um, Black history in space and time. And so I thought in doing this exercise and in this presentation, I would talk about spatio-temporal aspects that I've been thinking through for the past little while. Um, so I'm going to read some excerpts of my essay. Um, I came to the Afrotectopia Imagineer Fellowship tired. It was a deep emotional and spiritual exhaustion compounded by the weight of an ongoing global pandemic, a summer of protests in response to the ongoing circulation of Black death, Zoom fatigue, and an increasing sense of academic disillusionment. I, in my interview for the fellowship, I think I told Adi, I don't want to think like an academic, I just want to imagine like a human being. Our imagination dictates our purview, our potentiality. In a recent talk, Sadia Hartman said, so much of the work of oppression is about policing the imagination. For months, I felt as though I lacked the capability to envision, to see my life, my work, my identity in this world as otherwise. Over the past six weeks, I've read capaciously, interrogated critically, laughed from my belly, and imagined enormously. I found in my nine peers, and of course in Adi, a deep sense of kinship, one filled with shared visions, broad skill sets, global perspectives, and valuable life experience, and such incredible Black genius. This fellowship leaves my mind reeling, full of ideas and collaborations and goals that I hope to one day pursue, but more importantly, and perhaps most simply, it gave me permission to simply imagine. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to look backwards, and then I want to go forwards um, as I am sort of thinking within the present. We're guided by our ancestors. The futures we seek to achieve are informed by the past they waded through at the contemporary apocalypses they survived. We pay respect to their experiences, honor their knowledge, and absorb their truths. We recognize that someday we'll be nothing but our descendants' ancestors, our present realities informing their future imaginations, creation myths, and origin stories. Then these tools will belong to them. Inspired again by Sadia Hartman's critical fabulations, Antoine Williams' Black Fusionist Society, and the concept of a group poem, the Imagineers invented an ancestral toolkit, a multi-sensory guide designed to help navigate the present and the future based on the wisdom of the past. I found inspiration personally in queer historiographical reimaginings re in films like The Watermelon Woman and Born in Flames, and in books like The Faggots and Their Friends in Between Revolutions, all of which depicted the world not as it really was, but instead, instead imagined the possibilities of what could have been. As a historian who so often relies on a limited archive and a drowned archaeological record, I want so badly to reimagine radical pasts that we can make use of in the present to shape our futures. Sadia Hartman's concept of critical fabulation teaches us to read along the archival grain, imagining the potentialities of what could have been in the world if the historically marginalized and suppressed were given the opportunity to document and disseminate the stories of their lives. With this in mind, the Imagineers conceptualized a historiographical and ancestral toolkit to better document, articulate, and reimagine the past. As filmmaker Cheryl Dunye writes, sometimes you have to create your own history. Uh, next slide, please. And with the idea of creating your own history in mind, I want to look forward now. For the past several years, I've carried around two copies of the Negro Motorist Green Book, as well as the American Traveler's Guide to Negro History. When I had a car and ventured into a new locale, I pulled them out of my glove box and imagined what places, if any, might have been accessible to me decades ago. 
Now I prop my travel guides on my desk, flipping through them every once in a while when I need inspiration, when I'm thinking about black mobility, and when I wanna be anywhere else except my desk. As we imagined our way through the Afrotectopia syllabus, I returned again and again to these travel guides. The travel guides were designed to offer guidance and support the safe passage of black travelers during the Jim Crow era. In flipping through the guides on my desk while listening to the news, I found myself wondering, could we produce a travel guide for the end of the world? I sat with Munoz's Cruising Utopia for weeks, reading the first page over and over again, where he writes, quote, we are not yet queer, we may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. Queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or a concrete possibility for another world, end quote. I ruminated on Octavia Butler's parable of the sower, wherein she challenged us to recognize that persisting isn't always safe, but it's often necessary. Likewise, in our fourth week of the fellowship, Sige Tefese from Bufu came and spoke to us and she asked us, are you willing to survive for this cause? Uh, next slide, please. I've been thinking a lot about collaborations lately. My vision for the reiterations of this world does not exist in a silo. Rather, this, canoe, this renewed capacity to envision was gifted to me by my collaborators throughout the duration of the Afrotectopia Imagineer Fellowship. I'm inspired by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's notion of study in the undercommons, wherein they write, study is what you do with other people. It's talking, it's talking and walking around with other people, working, dancing, suffering, some irreducible convergence of all three, held under the name of a speculative practice. The point of calling it study is to mark that the incessant and irreversible intellectuality of these activities is already present. In reimagining the past and envisioning the future with my peers, I came to the realization that the most profound facet of the fellowship was that it made me wholly present, deeply captivated, and simply want to be here. As we all lean forward and engage in this participatory exercise of world building, I challenge us all to take time to find joy in the simple miracle of being here, together, existing wholly in this phase of corporeality. It's simple and it's plain, but I, I return again and again to Larry Mitchell when he writes, we got to keep each other alive in any way we can because nobody else is going to do it. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so beautiful. All right, next we have uh, Josie. Josie Williams and I'm going to present I'm going to read uh, your bio first. So Josie V. Williams is an Afrofuturist focused on the intersection of technology, art, and tech and culture. As an undergraduate, Josie presented her research in bias and chronic kidney disease prediction modeling in New IPS Fair's New IPS's Fair Health in a Machine Learning Workshop in Vancouver, Canada, and NYC Media Lab Summit in 2019. Her primary interests are machine and deep learning, algorithmic equity and creating human-centered AI. Josie is currently on the creative science track at, of New Inc, an incubator, incubator out of NYC's new museum that supports projects at the intersection of art, technology, and science. Her current projects revolve around chatbot conversations, the role of data and social change, and the use of biometrics for mass surveillance. Josie, it's all you. Thank you, Ari, and thanks for everyone who's attending. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you could just go to the next slide. So there are really like seemingly countless things this fellowship provided me the space to learn and remember, but above all, um, this fellowship has given me the gift of knowing nine other individuals who are actively rejecting the norm, um, who take the form of activists, organizers, poets, architects, urban planners and designers, uh, animators and technologists. And so really in short, this fellowship has gifted me a sense of belonging and community. And as we engaged with a syllabus comprised of brilliant thinkers who challenged us to rethink the extractive nature of Western technological practices and center black power in the world we seek to create. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, we read Techno Techno uh, Technology and Ethos by Amiri Baraka and reflected on his ideas that machines are inherently an extension of those who create it. Um, and the control of Western culture in shaping modern technology is oppressive by nature. Um, 
he goes on to like encourage us to think of technology from the lens of the post of post Western world. Uh, and in this manner, technology will begin to reflect the essence of the free people, of the freed people, freed from both the oppressor and the oppressor's spirit. And so this concept is summarized succinctly um, by Baraka, who states that the new technology must be spiritually oriented because it must aspire to raise man's spirituality and expand man's consciousness. It must begin by being humanistic. The technology itself must represent striving. It must represent at each point the temporary perfection of the, of the evolutional man and be obsolete only Josie, we lost you. It's the empire, y'all. Mm -hmm. Did I freeze? Okay, right after obsolete. Go ahead and continue. Oh, uh, yeah, just the quote. So, well, you know, be obsolete only what because nothing is ever perfect and that the only constant is change. And so while establishing my personal meditative practice, I found points of intersection between uh, the speculative and ra radical process of imagineering and spirituality. So for example, so you can go to the next slide. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, sitting meditation is an activity that deals with both the mind and body simultaneously. Um, and so during mindfulness practice, one follows the breath going in and out of the body and particularly the, the path of the out breath. And so according to Chogyam Chungpa, um, a, Tibet, a master of Tibetan Buddhist meditation, out breathing is an expression, uh, is an expression of stepping out of your system. Uh, it has nothing to do with centralizing your body. Usually everything is bottled up, but here you are sharing. You're giving something out. And he goes on to explain that since we need oxygen to live and to thrive, the in-breath becomes a confirmation of our existence and the out-breath an expression of that existence. And so all this to say that while exhale, exhaling is a feeling of relaxation and well-being, which creates space for openness, expansion, and the, and the dissolution of the individual into the universal, reflecting on this during the fellowship allowed me to build a reconstructed understanding of the now. And so this is an excerpt from, one, from my paper. We are the past, the result of generations of human experiences, of singularized and continuous big bangs, all individually cascading and flowing into this present moment. We are the future, as in the actions we currently take, visualize and imbue with collective ingenuity is the now yet to be manifested, that which is yet to be actualized. And from this perspective, all of time is carried through seamlessly in the form of a collective exhalation, a shared communion in the now. So the only real points in time are now and eternity, each different sides of the same coin. And this is how I also view Afro-Nowism. So Stephanie Dinkins, next slide, please. <laughs> uh, Stephanie Dinkins uh, defines Afro-Nowism as the willful practice that imagines the world as one needs it to be to support successful engagement in the here and now. Um, so adding my own inflection, um, Afro-Nowism is the practice of actively um, reimagining and reconfigurating one's uh, current environment to support successful engagement in the here and now with the understanding that the now embodies equally past, future, and present. So this means that we must focus on healing, um, healing and rectifying traumas of the past while actualizing a future that represents us in totality. So you can go to the next slide, please. So in Parable of the Sower, Octavia Butler wrote, all that you touch, you change, and all that you change, changes you. And that change is happening right now. Um, this moment, the now, is pregnant with infinite possibilities. There's infinite shapes that change can fall into. And so the outcome then hinges on intention and focused intention specifically. So, you know, asking questions about, uh, as asking questions like, in what ways am I sowing seeds of prosperity and unity? And in what ways are my doubts and fears clouding my visions? So radical imagination understood in, in this case to be the act of contextualizing the past while also framing the future with intention becomes the raw like, inorganic material that we can shape the future out of. Um, and such a powerful tool, sharp and untrained, demands continuous use and practice. 
and since the only use, and since use is the only condition of possession, we must ask ourselves, how can we cultivate the ability to adapt, to strengthen our intuitive foresight, and to foster bravery in the face of doubt and fear? Next slide, please. So the lessons fostered throughout this fellowship has allowed me to identify with my personal AI research practice and projects in a rejuvenated way. So for example, I'm working on algorithmic equity, a communal knowledge base of NYPD police officer behavior designed to cultivate and support community-led accountability and autonomy, along with ancestral archives, which uh, received its name kind of th the, throughout the series of the fellowship, at, like get, gathering all the momentum from my fellow peers, um, which is a collection of chat box um, modeled after historically significant people of color to continue to engage with our revolutionary ancestors. Next slide, please. And so in the face of white supremacy, in the face of the patriarchy, homophobia, and climate change, et cetera, I'm still inclined to remain optimistic about the future that we can create and share. And as James Baldwin once powerfully said, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means that you have agreed that human life is an academic manner. So I'm forced to be an optimist. I'm, uh, I'm forced to believe that we can survive whatever we must survive. However, in my opinion, I don't think survival should be the goal. And thriving has become the minimal requirement, has become the minimal requirement for us as a people. And so um, I believe that collectively, we can take hold of our individual autonomy and demand a revolutionized world. This can take the form of organizing locally within friend groups and neighborhoods. It can take the form of attending protests and sharing resources. Um, it can also take the form of standing up for each other and validating the precious nature of each individual life um, or visualizing harmonic futures through sketching and storytelling. But overall, my intentions for today is to serve as a gentle reminder to the, of the importance of you as an individual. The fact that isn't, is, uh, my intention for today is to serve as a reminder that you as an individual have such importance in visualizing the future that you want to see and the power to reject the imbalances of the world in exchange for something new. And as this fellowship has showed me, the people and resources you need are already there. It's a matter of, and they're waiting for you to connect and to utilize them, but you simply have to claim it and to affirm them. Thank you. Amazing, Josie. All right, next we have uh, Madevo. Ready when you are. All right, let me read your bio first. Uh, short and sweet, Madevo is a writer and futurist based in Cleveland, Ohio. All yours. See, y'all didn't have to do all that. I, uh, I resolutely did not read anyone else's bio because uh, I just wanted to meet y'all. And I knew I've been with y'all for six weeks, but y'all some geniuses. It's fucking beautiful. I love it. Um, I am, yes, a writer. Um, I'm a, uh, I, I guess my most native genre is poetry, but I sort of uh, rove around. And uh, I am also a professional futurist, so I collect my paychecks, uh, dreaming about futures. And the craziest thing about this whole experience to me um, is, I mean, how limited my imagination is continually revealed to me to be. Um, 18,950. Uh, that number represents almost nothing, but it is the amount of miles of coast that the continent of Africa has. So 18,950 uh, 18, miles of coast on the continent of Africa. Uh, I look at Africa a lot, um, a stupid amount. I just like stare at it. Um, and also I write futures about Africa. I write and research um, futures of the continent and the diaspora. I get paid to do this, y'all. In none of my futures ever in life was there even one surfer, right? So I've been living my whole life studying this stuff. 
And it took me until now getting to this fellowship and meeting Ya, who lives in Ghana and is an avid surfer. And I didn't know this was possible, Ya. Guess what is going to be in one of my futures? It's, right, black girls surf, right? And I didn't know. And I'm probably going to be weirdly insistent on my daughter surfing if she becomes a person, which we're negotiating. But, um, but the future is everywhere you don't expect it to be. Um, and, uh, and, and thinking about place, uh, I, uh, my slide is a bit of bad etymology. It's one of my favorite things just to sort of look at words and, and pick them apart. I am a poet. Um, and uh, Morgan, by the way, I'm planning another podcast uh, right now, but in the middle of your talk, I decided that you and I are going to be co podcast co-hosts and as a historian and a futurist uh, take on the world. Um, and it's just called Futurist I Know, um, and we're going to be friends forever. So uh, clear some space on your schedule. Um, so yes, uh, Afro from the root, y'all. Welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to be in company. Uh, tech from the Greek root, techne, meaning the art. Um, and art, not just at, in terms of things we consume, but um, the processes by which we create things. Um, and so, uh, Topia um, is a place. Um, and, and it's also the same root as the word topic. Um, so, uh, the Greeks uh, came up with a, some elaborate mental tools for thinking. And, and the simplest of them is just imagine a place that you know and place imaginary objects around that place and associate each one of those objects with a piece of knowledge. So Afrotectopia is uh, the art of, well, the art of black people in space in every iteration thereof, the art of black people taking space, the art of black people making space, the art of black spatial dynamics, uh, the black spatial arts. And uh, as somebody who is um, an avid manager, imaginer, um, the word imagineer, um, <laughs> shames me in that one, my parents really wanted me to be an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, and that didn't happen. Um, and I chose imagining. Um, but uh, I think I've built up something of a complex over the years, in terms of uh, telling people to their faces that, hey, um, fictions work. They change your mind. And, and they mean things and it will show up uh, on your balance sheet, but it is the balance sheet, right? It's sort of our like base of meaning, right? It matters. And here's how it could help your business. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been an experience I've been going through over the past year, um, especially since having completed grad school for Foresight, um, that while I was in grad school, I wrote uh, a paper that I called uh, I've actually got it up. I'm going to do the thing that they tell you to do, which is to quote yourself. Uh, so uh, Black Panther came out. I was pissed off because one, uh, I'm a, I was a big Marvel comics fan all the way through. I was a big fantasy fan. I was a big sci-fi fan. And when, I, and when Black Panther uh, came out, it was treated in the media often as like the first uh, Afrofuturist anything. And I, at the time in school for, for, uh, in school for foresight, for futurism, was looking around me and like, hey, what are we doing? Cause like Wakanda's cool, but like at the end of the day, this is a isolationist monarchy. Uh, hello, whoever just walked in. But uh, this is an isolationist monarchy. Was it has really dodgy politics, right? And like T'Challa is like a power fantasy. He's great, but we actually do this work in this world. And how is it that we're going to let that be the most thoroughly imagined future that Black people see, right, that has so little to do with their day-to-day -day lives? Um, and so I kind of charged up the futurists around me and was like, hey, we, like, what are we doing? We need to be more intentional about this. And it was a weird, it's a weird sitting because, the, like, the world of credentialed futurist is very, very small. Our professional organization, the Association of Professional Futurists, is like 500 people large um, and 2% Black. And so with all of those people in that room, um, 
I was, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was a young boy. It also tends somewhat older. Um, and looking around, not seeing a lot of myself and also thinking about the work I wanted to do when I, when I got out of that program. And so uh, looking, <laughs> right, um, how can we, um, sorry, I just looked at a chat comment, credentialized futurists, like how can you try to enclose the future, which, um, which has been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of my work since, and I'm still at the early stages, has been finding the ways and the places in which, uh, in which sort of these foresight tools that, that I've been taught and these foresight tools that were developed with a very Western lens um, can sort of be disidentified from their origins, can be repurposed and, um, and, and given into more hands to transform. And so I'm going to uh, I'm give a little, a little anecdote about um, that's, that's from my paper. Um, and, I've, and it's been structuring my thought as I've been moving through, uh, as I've been moving through this fellowship with y'all. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more after. But the, um, there was this Instagram story that I saw. I can't really remember how long ago I saw it, sometime within the last month. Um, I have not been able to track it down. I have not been able to uh, remember it fully, but the core of the thing was that there is a room full of people. These people are not wearing masks. They trust each other. These bodies are safe together, or at least that's what I like to think. Uh, they are sitting around, I think it's a living room. It also Sorry, my table, you're muted. I accidentally muted you. So that child has, has astonished everybody in the room a second before the video starts. I don't know what she did. I don't know what, yeah, I don't know what they were reacting to. Um, but it's everybody in the room just staring at this little girl. And this very prideful woman, I think probably her mother, but maybe an aunt, maybe a grandmother, maybe something else. Um, is just looking at her and has this crazy grin on her face. And it's like, I don't even know, baby. You just, you just freer than me, <laughs> right? Like, I just can't even conceive of what you just did and that's okay right that's your job is to do the inconceivable um and i've been thinking a lot about this little girl and i've taken in my head to calling her um that possible child and um i take that language from uh from a novel by china mieville it's called the scar and in this novel, which is a fantasy novel and kind of a steampunk era, um, but with uh, magic that is technological and steampunky in nature. Um, and there is this sword called the possible sword. It's a ceramic sword. It is connected to an engine by a lot of wires. This engine is worn on the wearer's belt. This engine, once flicked on, takes the sword and for every possible, for, and for every position of one's arm applies every single sword strike that is possible from that position of one's arm. And, and, um, and the reason that I think about this child and, and this sword, when I'm thinking about futures and possibility and the ways in which we construct our epistemology, what we can think, what we can do at the end of the day is I love the metaphor of one, the phalanx of ancestors that are surrounding this young person um, that are giving her the space to do her thing, but also there to protect her and there to protect the space that she has to do the thing. I also think about the child herself um, and, the, and the sword, right? And the sword it, it works off of the uncertainty principle. The one thing we know is your position, right? And so my dream is for everybody from every position to enable the conception of all possible futures that are imaginable from that, from that perspective. That's work, right? That's work. That's work. We got to teach. We got to imagine. And I cannot tell you 
um, being somebody who has been immersed in this world of speculative fiction, speculative futuring um, my entire life in one way or another, either as you know a reader or, uh, or a learner or now a practitioner. It's, uh, it is so over what, like the joy for me in this moment has not been like, oh, black people are in the future. It's been black people are here perceiving black futures, right? And, uh, and, and seeing uh, the waves sort of like take over, um, like at least my social sphere, right? And people being like, wait, no, we can really do something. Wait, no, we can really do something. And, and like, we can really think of things that just like aren't possible, right? And we can spend time in those places and start building them. And so to know that there is a Josie out there, right? Ready to put in work, right? from a place, right, from the same value st stack, right? To know that Morgan's out there, right? Working on the history while I'm out here working on the future. Like that warms me. And that knowing that, you know, that we have more minds thinking intentionally about the future and thinking critically about the future and building them, right? And doing both sides of the work at the same time and talking to each other. Uh, that's a new space. Right, that in and of itself opens up futures, and so uh, what this what this fellowship has done for me, which, yo, when Ari told me about it, I was like, man, I ain't got the time. This is not probably a great time for it. Like, this is just I don't know if I can make space in my life for this, and um, and it was worth every second of it. And I got like half the curriculum, y'all. Like, um, <laughs> I was not able to make a single Imaginarium. Uh, well, no, I was able to make a single Imaginarium. Um, uh, and every week, every one of our, like every one of our guest speakers, um, you know, another, right, another worker out there, another, another, another person creating a new future. And every one of these brains, right, that these futures are moving through is taking that and saying, yo, I got my own twist on that. Um, and and that's the most uh, that's the most encouraging thing for me. But uh, another aspect of of my entire journey with Afrotechtopia, not just the fellowship, is that Afrotechtopia has made my life possible in this way um, since I heard about it. So uh, three years ago, I write that article on Wakanda, uh, on Wakanda um, and I'm still burning hot. And so I spend the rest of that year coming up with uh, what I call the blockchain, which is my speculative future based around a Pan-African blockchain. Um, and so this is an economic system. This is sort of like a digital, it's Black Pan on steroids, right? Um, and I gave a talk about this and exactly one person who heard that talk reached out to me and was like, hey, let's collaborate. And she told me about Afrotechtopia. She said, I went last year, it was great. Her name is Devin Power. She is, uh, a, she's a professor at Drexel. Uh, she just wrote a book about trends research. It's called On Trend. Uh, she's incredible. Uh, she tells me about Afrotechtopia. I'm like, all right, cool. When is that? It's this summer. Cool. I drive up from Cleveland. I spend three of the most amazing days in my life and, you know, surrounded by people very much like we've been around in this fellowship. And I meet Ari and I'm like, hey, I don't know how you did this, but thank you. You found my tribe for me. Um, and she's kept doing it ever since. And so when she called and I was like, man, I can't do this, but also I wouldn't even have this new job, which I'm like seven weeks into a new job, uh, if it weren't for RE. Like if it weren't for Afrotechtopia, if it weren't for this space of possibility that's been opened up as I was seeking it. And so I did. And I am, uh, yeah, I, I, you never let me down. And you won't, I know. Um, and the position, and so the sort of new consciousness that has opened up for me is this, uh, this sort of work that I've been doing and thinking about public interest futures. Um, I had six, seven months of just awful interviews, uh, really before quarantine started and, and people were like, yo, we need a futurist now. Um, and at one of those, you know, the interviewer just said, Yo, are you sure you want to do this for businesses? And I was like, nah, but I got to eat. <laughs> I want to do this for communities. Like, I don't want to be looking at y'all. Um, and Afrotechtopia is, is sort of that seed community for me. And, uh, and I hope y'all will uh, 
y'all will invite me, take whatever knowledge I've got, share it with your communities, invite me to share it with your communities. Um, and, and let's keep building together because this is, uh, yeah, this is just beautiful. Um, and so I uh, want very quickly to read a brief excerpt from that novel I told you about where the possible sword comes from. Um, and I want us to, while we're hearing this, just be thinking about futures, right? And where they come from and how we receive them and what they do inside of us after that. All right, so this is a character named Uther Dole. He's the one who has the sword and he's telling, and he's explaining his operation to someone. If I were to toss a coin, most certainly it would land on one side or the other. It's just possible it might land on its edge. But if I were to make it part of a possibility circuit, I'd turn it into a coin of possible falls, a possible coin. If I toss that coin, things are way different. One of either heads or tails, or just maybe edge, will come up as before and lies there as strong as ever. That, the fact coin. And surrounding it, in different degrees of solidity and permanency, depending on how likely they on how likely they were, are a scattering of its nights, its close possibilities made real, like ghosts. Some almost as strong as the factual, fading to those that are just barely there. When the clockwork is running my arm and the sword mine possibilities, for every factual attack there are a thousand possibilities. Night sword ghosts, and all of them strike down together. When I strike on the sword, precision, when I switch on the sword, precision is the one thing I cannot afford. The more precise the strike, the more constrained potentiality, the more wasted the possible sword. I must be an opportunist, not a planner. I must fight from the heart, not the mind. Um, and so with that, I want you all, don't be precious about your futures. Imagine as many as you can. Um, don't be precious about whether it's practical. Imagine as hard as you can, as far as you can. Start at the edge of where you can imagine and push, right? Because we can all be that possible child. And if we can't be her, we can be her grandfather or we can be her mother. And we can look at her and say, baby, you're just freer than me. And that's my wish for all of us is that we can wake up tomorrow and 10 years from now and look at our kids and be like, baby, you're freer than me. I like this. I want like, yeah, I want to walk down to the beach with my daughter and be like, you want to surf? and have that not be weird. I want to live in the world where every beach I can imagine is full of black people. So y'all, 18,930 miles, let's get it. I will see you there. It's our continent, it's our home. Um, and uh, and Afrotectopia has definitely become another home for me. I love y'all. Thank you, Madeva. <laughs> I don't know how many comments I saw of you taking us to church. So thank you for that. <laughs> Last but very much not least, we're going to go with Yah. And I'm going to have your slides come up in a second. And let me introduce you, Yah. So Yah Ade is also known as Yah the Planet, is a Ghanaian British multidisciplinary strategist. The emancipatory potential of play is central to her practice as his dream work. Rooted in indigenous African invention, Ya works to reimagine cultural infrastructure and expand means of producing art histories. Drawn to collective knowledge making, Ya co-birthed Black diaspora literacy from Negritude to Drake with frequent collaborator Muna Muhammad. Supported by Tufts University's experimental college, Yana, designed and brought to life a 10 week course on the interconnectedness of black cultural production throughout the diaspora. Later, Ya was a researcher for the Mobile Pavilion and culminating cultural encyclopedia of African art, Ghana volume powered by Ano Institute of Arts and Knowledge, following the National Pavilion in 2019's Venice Biennial. Currently based in Accra, she does freelance communications consulting in the creative industry and daydreams about regenerative creative ecosystems via the art feature studio Accra. She is also the founder of the online anti-colonial art theory school Decolonize the Art World. Ya, yeah, it's all you. Hi, um, I'm Ya. 
Yes, it's a bit about me. I'm a Pisces. I daydream a lot. And um, this is based off of my, this is based off my final essay slash project for the Imagining Fellowship, which is reimagining museums as portals and keeping with a practice of dreaming and then trying to prototype something. I, um, yeah, I, I took this approach as well. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So um, I am generally quite obsessed with sci-fi, maybe not in the conventional sense. I don't read or watch a lot of it, but I think our lives are very sci-fi. Um, and I've always been really obsessed with time travel, even like on flights when you, you know, you travel and then you, you time travel, um, even with the land, how like the land has memory, um, thinking of ancestral communication also as time travel and all of these very like sci-fi things that are very much grounded in the present. Um, and so I was looking at the definition of portal, which um, is a doorway and a, go a gate or other entrance. And if you can go to the next slide. And thinking about how this might apply to museums, considering that, um, so as you can see, like museums were initially thought of as shrines of the muses um, an altar to inspiration, a sacred place of study, an opening through which meaning comes into the world. And if you look at um, the idea even of the genius as it's evolved over time, before the Renaissance, before in Europe things switched to humanism and like individuals, the genius was very much collective. And a lot of my work is in indigenous African cultural thought. And similarly, that idea is very integral and has always been there and still remains. This collective genius is collective knowledge making and also something that is a vessel, a vessel or an opening from God and artists are creators. In fact, um, just yesterday I was reading a Chinua Achebe article that a friend sent to me that went more into this, thinking of artists as those who have been chosen to share in creation with God um, and mimic that on earth. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So um, prior to Afrotechtopia, I wouldn't consider myself like a technologist or even someone who really considered or thought about technology that much. But this year in particular, I have started to research it more um, because of a piece I'd written earlier in the year about data healing and making online spaces safer. And then I started to think as, of technology, not just as what I knew before, which was very like Silicon Valley, um, very capitalist and more so as Ari began this whole um, presentation with looking at technology as extending human capability. And so in that sense, I see the museum as a very technological space, but a cultural one. And in my reflection, I write a bit about this saying, um, the museum is a product of cultural technology, employing display to create another, taxonomy to communicate place, derealization to isolate our experience and opacity to perform a seemingly neutral authority of knowledge. I also go into how the rise of the museum in Western Europe and what we have now in Harris today is very much linked to the rise of prisons and universities. And they were very much um, established together, creating like a totalistic world order of like white supremacy and tackling the mind, the body and the spirit. And so whereas like the prison is, is more so how you police our bodies, the museum is where how you police our minds and how you police culture. So this meme is sort of just a summary of um, how I see the museum and these are just three of the values that I took out from my essay. So you can go to the next slide. So then I'm thinking, okay, but what if we reimagine the museum as a portal? Um, and along these other values, which I very much experienced in the Imagineer Fellowship of imagining and feeling and dreaming and not so much um, a place where, going back to the idea of the museum as a place of study, um, not so much of display and not so much of um, upholding the status quo. Um, you can go to the next slide. So yeah, so this is just like a depiction of me. Well, that's not actually me, that's a meme, but me thinking about um, these values, these core values of 
a portal-like model, wonder, play, and imagination. You can go to the next slide again. And um, so this is an excerpt from my essay in which I write like a prophecy of what this might look like. So I'm going to read it. Okay, so field trip. Imagine this town. 15 minutes walk from your home is your local school on Lord Ave, adjacent to the Parnet Public Library on Morrison Street, down the street from the community ports on Octavia Crescent. Museums, now redundant relics of a colonial past, have been replaced with spaces for dreaming. After school, on the weekends, during lunch breaks, we come together and share in the creation of this world, all stakeholders in the future. Each portal depends on the needs of its community. Some are mobile, some are seasonal, some are envisioning 2,270, and others are in the here and now. At the core of every portal is play, wonder, and imagination. Portal guides, I believe they were called curators back in the day, steward us into this work with speculative design, participatory exhibitions, and technology. Display is a thing of the past. Now we experiment. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you, which is a quote by Octavia Butler. And to give some context to that, um, so I'm a curator and um, in undergrad, I created my own major and was studying comparative curatorial approaches and exhibition architecture. Uh, my laser then was working with this gallery that was experimenting with an alternative museum in a kiosk, but consistently coming up with this, coming against this challenge of, you know, the museum being so much more than just like the white cube model, just so much more than white walls and overhead lighting, but very much, it would, it would just keep being reproduced, even in experimenting, it would keep being reproduced. And during this time, I've been really inspired by how abolitionists have taken to getting us to understand carceral logic, as opposed to tackling prisons alone, but really understanding how police are so much more than people, but like a set of like practices and logics and you know, ways of being in the world that we need to confront or it'll just recreate itself. And similarly, I have been thinking, and that was behind this project and essay, what is the logic of the museum that continues to reinvent itself? And something I'm really grateful for in this fellowship is being exposed to and being able to dream with all these like amazing people in the fellowship and also through the Imaginarium. Um, and I remember like, you know, listening to Josie's work about artificial intelligence, um, listening to Bo talk about games. I was like, wow, like there's so much to technology itself that can be, that can be done. And as a curator, I have been wanting to know how to transform my practice into solely working within institutions in a world order that I no longer want to see exist. And more so how a curator could be someone who what's the word, like realizes our practices for world building capacity and stewards other people into that. And I feel like technology really has um, the room for that. And more of a, on that, um, something that I, this also makes me, that was also like very pivotal to this was understanding technology, not in the sense of, um, yeah, like the, the white Western sense, because I feel like, to do so erases all, all non-white, all non-Western invention. Um, but so yeah, I also am thinking of that and that's very much my framework when I say that these portal guides, um, curators of the past use speculative design, participatory exhibitions and technology. So you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and so um, lastly, and this is this, mood board slash plan slash design is in my um is linked in my essay but um so then i started designing an accra based port i'm i live in accra ghana um so i started designing an accra based portal like a small ideally i would do this in like three three to five months like a prototype of what these this portal model of museums could look like um so you have like a sketch in one corner um and I liken it to, oh, um, I go into that in the essay, but a huge part of these portals is that not only are they community based, they're also community dependent. They're very, um, it has to make sense in the context of where you are and the work that you are doing. 
which isn't to say that there are borders to these portals, they're not, but um, in the area that they are, that they are like community, the community itself is also a stakeholder in it. So um, I was likening it to in, in Ghana, a huge thing of the past, not as much anymore, were internet cafes. Um, people would gather and access the internet because of lack of digital infrastructure. And so using the internet cafe model, but rather as a space for gathering and dreaming. Um, and so I have some images of internet cafes, a music video that had an internet cafe that I thought was really cool um, recently. And um, this is from a Sandra Perry exhibit, the, I can't actually see any points here, but <laughs> yeah, I have other things on there. Um, and then I have some potential projects or exhibitions that this portal would explore. Um, to just touch on one, um, something that is a big conversation right now is all these looted, all this looted ancestral arts in museums across Europe, and North America primarily. And also what will happen then, I've been trying to think, okay, I know they're going to be returned. I'm speaking that into existence. And when they are, what is going to happen? Because what is happening now with um, ancestral and the traditional art that is like in Ghana specifically is they're exhibited in the same ways. Well, first of all, they're exhibited. You're still using these cultural technology of a, of a colonial museum still using display, still creating an other. Um, and it's particularly odd because this is art that, a one, that was very, not only aesthetic, but functional. And that is a huge part of like indigenous African cultural production. And although they can't be used in the same way because we're not living in the same ways and doing the same things, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a portal, um, a portal project of, okay, so how will we, engage with our ancestral art when it comes back, what ceremonies of healing, because also they've been in very traumatic places. They've been in dungeons in you know, Europe and the US for centuries. So what ceremonies of um, laying some of the rest, the way that we would with ancestors, would we do to cleanse them? And then, um, yeah, like what, what does that look like? What does this engagement look like? So that's um, one. And, Yes, but that's the summary of my, my project and idea. I go a lot more into detail into in the essay and have a bunch of hyperlinks. So, yes, thank you. Wow, Maya, yeah. incredible. And that's, those are all of our presentations. Uh, it would be nice if people could turn their screen on. The big part of Afrotectopia is that we could just see each other, see all these different black faces, to so be able to see all you all uh, and thank you for supporting the fellows. Um, now, you know, you can see why this space was just so special of just being, I feel so honored to have just been able to listen to you all imagine so intellectually and emotionally and sentimentally the futures. Um, so very, very thankful of each of you fellows showing up every single Sunday and really doing the work. A lot of you also um, heard them refer to essays. So also something that's coming out is each of them wrote about 1500 words in essays on you know reflecting on their experience and going into different projects uh, and their different ideas so all of those will be sent out this video will also be sent out and shared so everyone has access to watching it too uh, the idea was for us to move into conversation we're over time but i'm happy to keep this open and we can just talk if anyone wants to reflect fellows i know if you have anything to do you're free to go we, we're definitely over time and if anyone else has to leave, we can, um, you can feel free to do that, but definitely want to keep space if anyone just wants to be able to reflect in community and share any words. But for one, can we just give everyone, all the fellows, at least you can see it now, all the applause for your work. So incredible. And if you want to talk, you can just unmute yourself. It's kind of like the, how we did the Imaginariums. You can just say whatever is on your mind. What's next, Ari? This isn't over, is it? This is over for today. I don't know what's next. I'm just excited about what they did. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you. It ain't over. Okay. Um, Leah had shared something about, you know, you feel like you're the only one who thinks the way you do, so you feel very isolated. And then what these online spaces have allowed us to do is like find community with other people who think abstractly um, and like in the future. So I just want to say like, thank you all for everything that you shared. It was literally a sermon, so thanks.
Um, right. I just want to say that I just want to jump in real quick and say that when this video is done, uh, I think I'm going to use it just as a um, as positive vitamins, you know, just every day, just listen to it, just to remind myself, as I think one of the fellows said, that there are people who are brilliant, who are working on this. Um, and just to have the confirmation that that's true um, is a huge value just of the video alone, let alone the fact that I think all of the fellows are going to go on to actually make this reality. I feel like I need th these videos just as my own personal <laughs> CNN update of this is the, the, the real future is happening now. Uh, so thank all of the fellows for your amazing, amazing work. Totally bow down to you, your just amazing work. Thank you so much. I second that, AJ. Um, I just want to thank uh, you for uh, allowing me to be part of this uh, beautiful event because as an artist and intellectual person, to be able to be in a place where everything comes together, because my struggle has been as an artist, I struggle with, oh, can I create or can I think because of this division and to be able to see all these ideas coming together uh, beautifully and create um, or engage and think about the future. It's, uh, it's an incredible thing. Uh, thank you so much. And I can wrap it up there. The Zooms are a little awkward. It's hard to hold, hold an event on Zoom, but um, definitely wanted to create space for anyone that just wanted to bring anything into it. Thank you all for coming. I'll follow up with uh, emails on the writings and the video and take care. Have an amazing rest of your Saturday. Bye-bye.